Hi, I'm Brian Lord, your host for Free Virtual Fridays. This is your opportunity to check out great speakers and see how you can use virtual for your events. Today's guest is Karen Elizari. She's a former hacker turned cybersecurity expert. She's an internationally celebrated speaker and author on matters of cybersecurity and privacy. Her 2014 TED Talk, viewed by millions of people, has helped shape the conversation about hackers and their important role in society. Karen, thank you so much for coming on and joining us. Thank you so much, Ryan. I'm glad to connect with you. And in the past year, speaking with people via Zoom and other virtual platforms has really been a privilege to be able to reach more and more people. And in fact, the past year, I've had the chance to speak to people in Nigeria, China, Chile, Australia, places that would have been a lot harder for me to get to. So I'm grateful that we have this chance to connect. Thanks for the invite. Yes, yes, well, we're, we're very grateful to have you. So one of the things that you are known as is the friendly hacker. So our first question comes from Eric in Nashville. What is a friendly hacker? Great question, my favorite topic. So a friendly hacker is not just an ethical hacker, it's also somebody that you can reach out to. I've spent more than 25 years in the hacker community and I've always seen myself as a friendly hacker. Ever since I grew up with that notion of hackers as people who can help out, hacker heroes. In fact, the reason I got into the cybersecurity world in the first place is all because of Angelina Jolie, the actress. She portrayed a fierce high school hacker uh, in the movie Hackers, actually. This is, I got the limited edition soundtrack right here. <laughs> and uh, here she is right in the middle there. So this movie showed me that hackers can be heroes. I saw it as a teenager. It came out in 1995. And the idea in the movie is that these high school kids use their knowledge, use their power, use their curiosity and their passion for computers and for the internet to really do some incredible things, positive things. So they helped uncover corporate corruption. They helped prevent an ecological catastrophe. In fact, in the movie, they were dealing with a virus that was threatening to capsize an oil tanker. So mm -hmm. if you think about in the past years, we've seen viruses that are actually disrupting our daily lives, healthcare services, infrastructure, energy. Friendly hackers are the ones that can help us in this battle in the cyber security field. Friendly hackers are the ones that uncover vulnerabilities, that work with corporations and with governments, but sometimes always individual hacktivists, not part of any organized group per se. They're just people who are passionate about technology, like I was growing up in this world. So that's a friendly hacker. And believe it or not, there's hundreds of thousands of us all around the world which is why in my TED talk, I talked about friendly hackers as elements in the global digital immune system. Mm. And you know what, what better year to talk about the digital immune system than right now. In the past year, we've all had to build up our digital immune system. And I think that's a place where hackers can actually teach us a lot, but it's not just about friendly hackers. You know, there's, um, there's also malicious hackers out there and uh, we can learn a lot from them too. So how does somebody build up their, their digital immunity, uh, immune system? So the first thing to understand about cybersecurity on the personal level at home or in the office is just like our public health situation, it comes down to individual decisions that we make each day. When we install a new application, when we sign up for a new service, many of us, for example, recycle passwords. We reuse passwords across different services. I know some of you listening have done that. I know that for a fact because we've seen it in data breaches. We see the same username and password questions pop up. So that's a simple thing you can make differently to make life much harder for attackers because for the bad guys, for cyber criminals, for malicious hackers, password reuse is just one of the very easy tools that they have to get into organizations, even into your personal devices and services. So that's one thing. Another thing, build up your digital immunity is to make sure that at home around you, if, if you look around, there's probably more digital devices than family members and pets. Of course, depending on you know how you live your life. Sometimes I have people that join me on calls and they say, well, I've got a, a whole bunch of fish in the aquarium. I've got a, a sheep farm in the backyard. And in, in that case, I really congratulate them on their life's choice. But in, in most cases, we have more digital devices in our household. And these digital devices are actually ours to manage and to care for. They're part of our household. 
So building up your immunity also means looking at your digital data republic, your home and the different devices and thinking about, okay, have I updated the operating system? Have I used a unique password? When's the last time I updated the uh, operating system for my internet router? Mm. Do you know when this, when's the last time you did that? I do not. So you've got me on that one. I know, right? <laughs> so that's the thing. If you don't know that, who will? There's nobody else that's going to help you defend your, you know, your home republic, as it were. And in the past year, because of COVID, your home republic is now, you know, part of the organizational network. It's part of the corporate. Home is not just a new office. It's where people live many aspects of their lives these days. And these security problems at home, these vulnerabilities, the lack of immunity can actually lead to much larger problems because one person's choice, you know, just clicking on the link or installing an application or maybe responding to a, a phishing email, a phishing email, which is an attempt by a criminal to get your credentials or to get some sort of secrets out of you. That's oftentimes the first step that the criminals have to get into the organizational network. So that's what building your digital immunity is all about. And there are things we can all do, but it starts with recognizing that it's personal responsibility and everyday choices. And we all make hundreds of security decisions each day, whether we recognize it or not. How, what should businesses ask their employees to do? So firstly, I think businesses should ask their employees to behave at home just like they would at the office and the other way around. And that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but we should treat, we should treat our digital devices as if we would treat our, you know, our home devices the same as we do, do with our work devices. We should treat them with respect. We should have updated operating systems, unique passwords. And there's one really unique thing that's kind of popped up in the past year. Well, actually it's not that unique because everybody does it. Because of the new hybrid work reality where people are spending some time at home, some time at the office, people are also sharing devices. So maybe the laptop that you got from your employer is also what your kids are now using to access school resources. Or maybe your personal tablet is something that you're using to log on to a professional event. So this mixed use actually requires us to take on more responsibility personally when we use these devices to have those updated operating systems to not reuse passwords to not just install any app or click on any link that comes our way and this holds true for personal and professional devices they're the same in this case i want you to treat them in the same ways mm -hmm. how have cyber criminals adapted to the COVID 19 crisis this is one aspect that's been really fascinating for me as a security researcher in the past year tracking how criminals adapted to the COVID-19 reality. They haven't wasted a minute. They say never waste a good crisis. Criminals pounced on, on this situation. So within days of uh, countries locking down and the announcement about the pandemic and the World Health Organization announcing it as a global emergency, within days there were criminal campaigns utilizing this as a great way to get people to download malicious apps that masqueraded as COVID-19 information apps or contact tracing apps. It was a great opportunity for criminals to set up fraud campaigns. So for example, in the UK, a relief grant option was offered to people that needed financial help. Within hours from that website being set up by the UK government, there was a fake web website that looked exactly the same that was reaching out to people, asking them to provide financial information so that they can get financial help really adding insult to injury, because these are people that are already seeking assistance. And this is what criminals really jumped on, the opportunity. This is in times of such uncertainty, people are very easy to fool, easier to fool than before. And people are really in need of answers, of help. So they are going to maybe download that app or click on the link or even share information. Even if somebody were to call them over the phone or send them a text message, they were more likely to fall into the traps set up by these clever criminals. But it, it wasn't just that. It wasn't just new types of ways to reach people. Criminals also took the money that they made from ransomware, which was probably the most successful criminal uh, brand or the criminal trend of the past couple of years, where a virus encrypts the contents of a computer and then requires a ransom 
to basically give you back access to your own information. Almost a perfect crime if you think about it. They don't have to steal anything. They just take away your own access. So criminals made a lot of money with ransomware attacks and they took some money and they invested it back into R&D. Just like the most innovative organizations in Silicon Valley, criminals take back about 20% or 30% according to some estimates and they put that back into developing new capabilities, developing new tools, new types of malware, new infrastructures so that they can reach more people. One such group, which is behind a very successful malware called Emotet that was just taken down a couple uh, months ago by law enforcement. Emotet was very successful for more than eight years and they put in money to reach their audience. What do I mean by that? Well, they put in money to create um, translation infrastructure so that they would send out emails, not just in English, but they would send out emails in Japanese, in Hindi, in French, in Scandinavian languages with specific topics, with automated email creation that would allow them to just reach a much broader audience. And those emails would often be the first step for somebody to click on a file, run it, and then introduce the virus into the network. So criminals have really used the past year to come up with more and more ways to reach people. And they've also been thinking about their business models. So for some organized crime, because of COVID, regular or traditional criminal activities had dried up. So they came up with alternative revenue streams. They are thinking just like businesses. In fact, in some cases, they're more agile, more innovative than some traditional businesses. And some of these new business models include uh, the threat of extortion. So for example, not just ransoming the files, not just encrypting your files, but actually threatening to release all of an organization's secrets, all the corporate's secret files to everybody. And, and they did this to major entertainment brands, major consumer electronics companies, energy, healthcare, academics. No business sector has been immune to this style of attack. And I predict we're gonna see more and more of it in the coming years, because it's very successful for criminals. And unfortunately, we allow them or we let them come in because we make sometimes not the best decisions when we're faced with that opportunity to click on something or to install something. And that's where we all need to get smarter. Is that the advice you would have for someone? So taking sort of examples that you had with the, the crisis in the UK, and what people were doing there and then also for businesses what advice would you give those people so there is that issue there is it is it more the passwords or how do you understand if something is legitimate or not so there's a couple of key things i want you to remember number one stop recycling passwords it's not the good kind of recycling i'm all <laughs> pro recycling don't recycle your passwords try and think beyond passwords wherever you can come up with maybe pass phrases which will be longer and interestingly, passphrases are actually easier for people to remember because you can use a quote, an inspirational quote, maybe even uh, lyrics from a song you like or a poem. These are things that are actually easier to remember. So wherever you can, try and use passphrases, try and use biometric authentication where that's an option for you. Try and use multi-factor authentication where you receive an additional text code or you have to open an app, something that uses your phone in combination with your um, online login. So these are some simple steps. And according to research done by Google on Gmail logins, multi-factor authentication can reduce 90% of account takeovers. Yet only about 10% of Gmail users have that activated in their wow. account. So this is a simple step that's usually offered for free. So think beyond just passwords. Passwords really belong in our past. They are no match for a digital reality. That's number one. The second thing, how do we know how something is legit? This is really the number one problem of our information age. We're bombarded with information. How can we verify it? And this is true, not just for cybersecurity. Of course, it's true also for how news meets us, how we encounter information in the public space. So this is where we need to, first of all, use our common sense, but also be a little bit proactively paranoid, which is what you know hackers have been doing for many years. Being proactively paranoid helps. And it's actually more useful than being retroactively paranoid because that's usually kind of too late. So what does being proactively paranoid mean? When you receive a piece of information, 
verify it with another source. If somebody reaches out to you and they say they're from a bank or a government agency or another type of institution, well, you can ask to get back to them and then call the number that's published on that website or on the, even in the yellow pages for that organization. That's one way to verify that you're actually speaking to that organization. You're not speaking to some bogus, uh, in many cases, by the way, a call center set up by fraudulent hackers, in many cases set up in India of all places. It's a very interesting phenomenon, by the way. And there's a whole, um, you know, we, we could probably have an entire conversation just about the mechanisms and the ways that fraudsters use call centers around the world to trick people. Hmm. But ultimately what I'm trying to share with you here, cybersecurity is about personal choices. It's not just something that somebody else is gonna take care of for you. It's not just a job for military generals or for your company's IT squad. It's something that relies on us making individual decisions each day. Just like the COVID-19 crisis got us used to wearing masks, maintaining social distancing, getting vaccinated where we can. In the same way, we need to build up our cyber hygiene practices, not just our um, distancing and uh, safety measures, but also in the digital realm. And that's what it's all about. It's about making better decisions each day. And it's about learning from hackers who show us what's possible and force us to evolve, which is something I really believe in. So one thing that I find is interesting. So you're in Israel, uh, in Tel Aviv, and we are, are based here in the States. Um, you know, with geopolitics and cyber, um, who are the countries, you just mentioned a couple, that are most active in the cyber warfare arena? And what are their targets and motivations? That's a fantastic question because that's something I've been researching for years. So being based here in Tel Aviv and in Israel and working with the Israeli military and with Israeli government agencies and with Israeli academics, I've really had a front row seat to the evolution of cyber warfare as it's being played out on the global arena. And it's probably safe to assume that the countries you're thinking about are not necessarily the most dangerous threat actors out there. So the countries that have been very active in cyber warfare are in many cases ones that enjoy the asymmetrical advantage. What do I mean by that? They're countries that don't necessarily have that strong military presence or industrial presence that allows them to benefit from the same things that Western powers like the US, for example, can benefit from. So, you know, countries like Germany, the UK and the US have great cyber defensive capabilities, but it's actually countries like Iran and North Korea, and in some cases, Southeastern countries that utilize cyber warfare, utilize cyber espionage to make up for some of their disadvantages. So they use cyber espionage to get intellectual property, to get R&D information about new types of technologies, new developments. In the past year, pharmaceutical organizations and healthcare organizations developing the COVID vaccine have become prime targets for, for hacking crews from countries like those I mentioned, as well as China and Russia, who have been extremely active in the cyber warfare domain. In this case, not just uh, not really benefiting from that asymmetrical advantage, but also benefiting from the fact that they're not members in the same ideological club, let's call it, as most of the rest of the world, which really allows them to make the choices that they make and, be, and really use cyber capabilities and to a certain extent, get away with it. And that's, that's really something that I think and I hope is going to change in the next couple of years with the international community and with Western allies trying to hold some of these countries more responsible for the cyber attacks that they've initiated. But I do want to say, I, I do want to add one more thing to that, if I may, Brian. Sure, sure, in definitely. This, in this day and age, we shouldn't be surprised that government leaders are utilizing cyber capabilities because from their point of view, it's some of the best tools to achieve their goals. It has the best ROI, the best return on investment. You spend a couple million dollars on a team of researchers and hackers on developing software attacks and developing exploits, and you receive in return the value and the leverage and the impact that a military force would 
cost a lot more to achieve the same type of goal and would also be perhaps a lot more dangerous in terms of the cost to human lives. So it's no surprise to me that cyber warfare is such a useful tool for politicians, for, for government leaders, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. It's going to become more and more part of our lives because it's a way to shape reality. And for certain government leaders, it's been a very effective way to shape reality. So speaking of shaping reality, not just from like a global perspective, but also nationally and everything else, you know, two of the biggest things that people are, are you know, have to make their decisions about are things that include like fake news and deep fakes. Um, what is the future of trust? I know you've mentioned that as, a, you know, the future of trust. Um, what are people going to be able to trust, not trust? What should they look out for there? I believe trust is the number one thing that we all need to build and we all look for these days. It's really perhaps the most scarce resource out there. It's not uh, time or money or information. We seem to have quite a lot of these. It's really how can we establish trust? And that's something that politicians and corporate leaders and individuals are seeking. So I think that companies that can learn to really build their brand and build their technology in the way that is trustworthy will be poised for success. While I believe the companies that have maybe mishandled people's trust are going to really pay the price for that, either financially or with their reputation. And we see that happening and playing out all the time. From my perspective, on the very pragmatic technical level, I think we're going to towards an era where we're going to have to verify people's identities in a much more sophisticated way. We can't rely on usernames and passwords. We can't even necessarily rely on an image or a video of a person. So this is where more sophistic sophisticated technologies come into place. One area that I'm looking at specifically is continuous behavioral biometrics. And that sounds spooky. It's a little <laughs> bit big brother. It does sound spooky. But what it basically means is that there are technologies in place that can track our behaviors online. For example, when you log in to your online banking account, you, there's usually specific things that you do. You behave in a specific way. Even the way you type in your password, the, the frequency and the cadence of your typing can be associated with an individual. And there are companies and organizations and academics that are developing tools to measure these things, the way we behave online so closely, so carefully, that they will really be able to ascertain people's identity and verify it to the highest degree of accuracy. So that's an area I think this is an area that's going to be developed uh, in, in the next few years. Certainly financial institutions are already utilizing it. So if you've never heard about behavioral biometrics and continuous behavioral biometrics, you've probably already experienced it when you logged into your bank because a lot of financial institutions use it. I think we're going to see more of that in other aspects of our digital lives where technology is going to come into place and hopefully help us verify true from false and establish trust. And the next step would be to bring in technologies and algorithms that can also help us identify false information from true information, false social media profiles from real ones. And there are great people, great researchers working on this problem, making headway. I am hopeful. And as a techno optimist, I do feel and hope that there are some great technological solutions out there that's that are going to help us. Until then, we have to use our common sense and we have to be proactively paranoid. <laughs> One of the things I love about having you on is that you can cover so many different topics. So switching gears completely here, but I want to make sure we get this in. Um, what can I teach my kids about security and hacking? I've got four kids myself, so uh, it's a big topic at the Lord household. So what are some things that we could teach our kids about security and hacking? I'm happy to hear it's a big topic in your household because guess what? It's not a job that's going to go away. According to a lot of industry reports, this is this industry, the cybersecurity industry needs 4 million more security professionals. So that's a lot of jobs and they're going to need all the help they can get, including from your household and including from all parts of the world and kids from all backgrounds, all nations. So there are 
really some great resources to get your children started and interested. First of all, if your child is part of the Scouts organization, I know the Girl Scouts has cybersecurity merit badges and trainings wow. for girls of all ages. And they've had that for more than five years. Fantastic program by the Girl Scouts. There's also hacking events online for kids as part, usually as part of uh, hacking conventions like DEF CON, which is the world's largest hackers convention. There, there's usually actually a specialized event just for kids. I think it's called the Roots Asylum. There's also um, Hackidemia, Hack Kids Academia. It's a little <laughs> world play. Uh, there are games, there are online games that uh, kids can play. One is called, I believe, Control Alt Hack, and it's a card game that teaches cybersecurity skills. And there's also, for those that are a little bit more hands-on, there's a website called Hack the Box, which allows in individual hackers to test their skills legally on a simulated environment with interesting challenges. And you know, Brian, actually some of the best hackers out there in the world right now are under the age of 16. In fact, in the bug bounty programs that contribute bugs, that find vulnerabilities, that a lot of companies have nowadays, they receive reports from children as young as 10, eight in some cases. And these are kids that are just curious. They use technology and they, you know, they open their minds and they see a problem. They go down that rabbit hole, they chase that lead and they find a bug, they find a vulnerability and they report that, they get recognized for their efforts and they become in turn cybersecurity professionals. So this is a great pathway to get your kids started on. And I, for one, think we need all the help we can get. So bring them on. <laughs> so that actually leads in really well to one of our listener questions. So I know there's certain things we wanted to hit coming in. And so now I've got some time for some questions. So this is Jill from Kennesaw, Georgia, you're talking about hacker conventions. How do you keep your, how do you keep your stuff safe when you go to a hacker's convention? Uh -huh. <laughs> Fantastic question. So firstly, from my side, when I went to my first hacker's convention in the US, when I went to DEF CON for the first time, I was, briefed by some of my uh, elders, as it were, some industry veterans who told me what to bring, what not to bring. And usually when you walk around the conference floor, at least for me, I try and keep my phone and my computer in my hotel room, maybe in the safe, turned off. And some people bring uh, a burner device or a throwaway device for a hacker convention so that they can participate in hacking games and competitions and not put any of their own personal information at risk. However, I also want to point out that hacking conventions don't have to be scary. In fact, there's a global network of very friendly hacker conventions called B-Sides. And I actually started B-Sides in Tel Aviv. Hopefully you can see that. Oh. So this is the challenge coin from B-Sides Tel Aviv 2020, which was a virtual event. You can see we put a COVID mask on there as well, <laughs> just to make sure. Uh, but B-Sides is a global network of hacker community events. There's B-Sides in Augusta, Georgia. I know that for a fact. There's B-Sides in Tel Aviv. There's B-Sides in London, Zurich, Amsterdam, San Francisco, Las Vegas, Cairo, Athens, New Delhi, the list goes on. Hundreds of B-Sides events in specific communities. If you're curious about learning more, if you have teenagers, maybe that would be a great place to start. And you shouldn't be too concerned to bring your phone or your laptop to something like B-Sides because it was started as a very accessible community conference. And that's why I started the one in Tel Aviv because I wanted to give back to the Israeli community where I grew up, where I really made my first steps. So you should go, first of all, the first step is to go to a hacker's event. Maybe leave your phone, your laptop, but what you do need to bring is your learning mindset, because I guarantee you it will blow your mind. And if you're hiring talent, you might find the best talent for your company at a hacker conference. You'd be surprised. All right. So next question, what do we need to worry about with our phone security? This is from Keith in Brooklyn, Iowa. Okay, great question. So phone security, a couple of things, actually three things. One, it's the operating system. So the operating system of your phone needs to be updated. With Apple devices, it's usually a little bit easier because there's automatic updates and the ecosystem kind of um, prompts you and supports you in putting in those updates. With Android, you gotta be a little bit more self-proactive to make sure you get those updates. But software updates are like vaccines. 
They're what you want to be as most up to date because that's going to prevent the easy attacks, the malicious applications, the really simple to use tools that hackers have from uh, really becoming a problem for you. So you want to have the updated operating system. That's number one. Number two, the things that are sent to you, text messages or calls or incoming messages or emails, you really need to be mindful of who they're coming from and try and really verify the identity of the sender. Don't just respond, don't just click, don't just interact. Really use your, your common sense for a moment. And if you're not sure, or if it looks like it's coming from a bank or a government agency that you need to be in touch with, there's always ways to verify their identity on another, you know, in another website or even in the yellow pages and reach out to them. So that's the second thing, things that are coming at you, they're coming at you. That doesn't mean you gotta interact with them right away. Take a moment, think about it, and then act. The third thing is the things that we put on the devices. Photos, apps, sometimes we download apps uh, that we are not sure what they actually do and we still allow them to live on our phone. Every once in a while, I like to just do like a spring cleaning, go through my phone, see if there's any apps I don't need to use anymore, any apps that maybe are not spring me or, I don't like the way they're using phone information, my location information, my photos. The same thing for photos or other private things that you keep on your phone. Your phone is yours, it's private, but it's not secret, right? There's a definition between private and secret. And if you really have secret things, maybe don't keep them on your phone. It's probably not the best place to keep them. So <laughs> that would be my recommendation to you, Keith from Brooklyn, Iowa. All right. And next question, this is from Emmy Dagnall from Corsicana, Texas. How did you get into uh, white, hat, ha white hat hacking? So I blame Angelina Jolie for my career choices. It was really yeah. seeing that movie in 1995. I was a very curious little girl. I was passionate about technology. I received access to the internet just you know, at the age of 12 or 13 here in Israel in the early 90s. It was very new thing and I was I kept exploring this digital universe for questions I had questions upon questions and I wanted to get all the answers and at some point I realized that in order to get those answers I needed to understand how the internet worked and in some cases the answers were on other people's computers they were on servers on the other side of the world maybe protected by passwords or maybe set up in a way to limit the information only to an academic institution so i had to teach myself how to get access to that information and that's how i became a hacker but when i saw the movie with angelina jolie as the hacker hero it really resonated with me it captured my imagination because i saw this is not just something that i care about or my hobby it's called being a hacker and there's a global hacker community. And that movie really gave me a calling. And I'm, I feel very lucky, very fortunate, because even today, not every 14-year-old girl gets to watch a Hollywood movie and see a role model and decide this is what she wants to do with her life. And this is what I've been able to do with my life. And it's been very rewarding. So if there's anybody listening who's thinking about whether cybersecurity could be a good career path for them, I recommend it. And I also want to point out that there's space for everybody in this ecosystem. More and more women are finding their place in the cybersecurity workspace. I, for one, am very proud to have started a group called the Leading Cyber Ladies, which is a nonprofit network for women in cybersecurity. We started in a meetup with 20 ladies here in Israel, and we now have almost 2,000 members around the world. And there are many more women that are in this field. So it's a space that's welcoming to anyone, everyone and anyone. If you're curious about it, if you want to consider a new job. It's definitely one where we'll have to raise our children to be knowledgeable about because cybersecurity is about our way of life. It's not just about protecting our secrets or our credit card numbers. And it's going to be here to stay and it's going to be very important for our future. So let's get everybody involved with cybersecurity. All right, two more questions here. So next to the last one, uh, we've got a question from uh, Brian in Chicago. How are cyber attacks traced? It appears to be an inexact science. So it truly is an art and a science. Some people say it's the dark art of really <laughs> tracking cyber attacks. And specifically, there's something we call in the business 
attribution. Attack attribution is really the holy grail. It's very difficult to attribute an attack and say this group is behind that attack. This particular unit in the Chinese military or this particular group of the North Korean hacking team known as Lazarus was behind this specific attack. By the way, Lazarus from North Korea are the ones that have been attributed by the American authorities, by the FBI, to be behind the attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment, if you remember that hack from almost eight years ago. So this work of attribution, it's really detective work, and it's fascinating to watch cyber threat intelligence experts work days and nights to identify the specific tools, the modus operandi, the capabilities, the software languages, the hardware preferences, the really the they analyze the mechanism, the, the weapons, if you will, of the attackers, just like a forensic investigator in a CSI show, only they do this digitally. And to try to really come up with a pattern that matches a specific group, who does it usually target? How do they usually get in? Is it an email? Is it by taking over a internet server? Is it through a software update? Like we recently saw in the US with SolarWinds, a company that was unfortunately hacked to hack its clients. So really it's detective work and it's fascinating work. It's not always accurate. However, when the FBI or other government agencies and law enforcement, when they come out and they say, this is the group that's behind that, they usually have really solid information, really solid intelligence. And in some cases, they can get to the actual persons that you know were behind the keyboard. So one of the things I do, and you don't have to do it, Ryan, but this is one of the things I do in my weekends is I read the Department of Justice uh, indictments. They bring the indictments against specific hackers and I read them because these are very detailed documents where the Department of Justice has to show the court that they track down this individual and they prove it and they show, you know, we track their online identities, their servers, the tools that they use, the software that they use. And it's really fascinating. If you want to learn more about that, for the person who asked the question, uh, look up some of the DOJ's indictments for cyber criminals. It's a fascinating field. You could definitely do a CSI show just about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of speaking of shows, um, I know you've mentioned Angelina Jolie. So, so final question here. Uh, you know, which movies? Uh, you mentioned hackers. Which movies get hackers? Right. You know, so it's not I, you're not wearing a hoodie right now. I have to drink Fanta. I don't know about <laughs> it. Like, you know, so uh, which movies and TV shows get hackers right? F fabulous question. So one of the things I'm, I really enjoy is watching hackers representations in the media and TV and film and comic books, because I was lucky to be inspired by media. And I think media plays a really important role in our lives because the, the way we talk about hackers, the way you show hackers is actually shaping reality. For me, the movie Hackers got a lot of things right culturally in the ideology and the zeitgeist, the music, even the fashions of the film, and specifically the choices that they made, the choices that they made to prevent that ecological catastrophe, to uncover the criminal and not just to you know, get away with a lot of money. They were not the bad guys in the movie. Other shows and movies that get it well, just a second, there's a, yep. can you hear it? I cannot. Okay. Okay, it's not the, um, it's not the shelter siren. It's just, it was just an ambulance, but I wanted to let it pass. Okay. Yes, yeah, certainly. So other shows that get it right, uh, Mr. Robot is a fantastic show by USA Network that gets it extremely right. And this is because they actually worked with hackers as consultants on the show to develop the technologies and the tools that the hackers in that show use. In fact, if you're curious about it, I made a video for Business Insider about how realistic hacking scenes are in movies and the television. You can look it up on YouTube. How real is it hacking scenes in movie and television? And I, you know, I rated some of the better ones and the worst ones. But to me, TV shows like Mr. Robot, ha ha movies like Hackers did a really great job. Um, I want to mention The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. It's a series of books, not just movies. And there are certain elements there that are extremely realistic, and I think they did a pretty good job. 
Uh, the books are not easy to read for other reasons. They have some very difficult subject matter, but they really did a pretty good job describing some of the technic technical capabilities and the mindset of hackers. So if you're curious about that, you can definitely give that a watch. Uh, get it right, I have to say. Hopefully in the future, we'll see more realistic shows. From my perspective, the detective work that goes into hunting down a cyber attacker is absolutely fascinating. There's a great book by Wired Magazine journalist Kim Zetter about Stuxnet, uh, which is the first cyber web of the digital age. So I'm reading that as well, if you're curious to learn a little bit more. And in the future, I hope we'll see more friendly hackers and they might look like this. <laughs> Well, Karen, thank you so much for coming on and being part of our free Virtual Friday event series. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I'm grateful for the opportunity to connect with everybody virtually. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe, stay well, and I hope to see you soon, virtually or in person. Take care. Great. Well, Karen, thank you again. And for those watching, make sure to uh, check out Karen's page on our site. Uh, as well as um, uh, on our uh, freevirtualfridays.com. And uh, make sure to check us out next month. So on behalf of Premier Speakers Bureau and National Speakers Bureau, thank you so much for tuning in.